Welcome to the Empire's preseason podcast series. Today we will be talking about the Villanova basketball team and our opinion on their outlook for the season. I am Benjamin Simon. And I am William Derry. Villanova returns for the 2017-18 season after a disappointing end to last year, losing to the ace seeded Wisconsin Badgers in the round of 32. In Josh Hart's last season, the Wildcats could not follow up the NCAA championship run they made the year before. But the Wildcats have established themselves as a perennial power, ranking 6th in the AP preseason poll. Villanova will be led by head coach Jay Wright, who enters his 17th season, and Jalen Brunson, who earned preseason All-American honors, as they will look to make a legitimate run at the national championship once again. Well, if we're looking at this team after losing um, Josh Hart, um, Chris Jenkins, and the year before, um, Ryan Archidiacono and Daniel Chefu, is this a team... Um, with the core that they have that can make the run that they made um, you know, two years ago or even have the success that they had last year? I think so. With returning Jalen Brunson, Phil Booth, who is now healthy, and adding Amari Spellman, who missed last season due to an, a forced academic redshirt, I think they are, I think they do have the right players to make another run in March. If, you know, if we're going back to last season when they won the first 14 games of their regular season and unfortunately lost to Butler 66-58 to at Hinkle Fieldhouse in Indiana. Following that, they went on a five-game winning streak before losing to Marquette 74-72 at Marquette's home arena, the BMO Harris-Bradley Center. Villanova rebounded after that, going on a seven-game winning streak, but... Butler came to the pavilion and beat them again, 74-66. Villanova finished their year winning their last two games of the season before going to Madison Square Garden in New York City for the Big East Tournament. They blew out St. John's in the first game, 108-67, and then got past Seton Hall, who beat them the year before and won the Big East Tournament, 55-53, in a tightly contested battle. And to finish out the Big East tournament and to win the championship, they beat Creighton 74-60. to Now, when Villanova entered the March Madness tournament, a lot of people thought that they would make a deep run, possibly go to the Sweet 16 because of their seeding. They were the number one overall seed. They got past Mount St. Mary's in the first round by double digits. But they ran into Wisconsin, who... Were, who were able to close out the game. Villanova had a chance towards the end to defeat the Badgers, but they just couldn't pull it out. But one thing that, one takeaway from that Wisconsin game was that Dante DiVincenzo, who I didn't mention yet, but who got injured his freshman year, which caused him to miss that season, uh, came back last year and was one of Villanova's most productive players off the bench. He's a Delaware native who is one of the most athletic guards on the roster, probably the, probably the, with probably... Or Bridges. Alongside, yeah, Bridges as well. Bridges, him and Bridges are two of Villanova's better athletes. And I think that last year, with his play during the March Madness tournament and him being one of the better players on a team that still had Josh Hart, Chris Jenkins, um, I think that showed that, you know, he has the capability of being something special. So I think that, you know, having Dante... Bridges, Brunson, and now with Phil Booth, who missed a lot of time last year due to a knee injury. I think they do have a pretty good chance of making a run this March. Yeah, I really, I don't know if they're going to be able to make the run that they made the last couple of years. I think um, Villanova fans and City Six fans alike will be disappointed, um, I think, in the Villanova team this year. Um, I'm not saying that they're going to be bad. I think they'll be a top 25 team all year. I think they'll be probably a top 20 team all year. Um, I, just, I just don't know if they have enough. And um, People are really high on Jalen Brunson, um, but it's different playing beside Josh Hart and having the load all on you. I think Jalen Brunson is the real deal, um, but I don't necessarily um, have a lot of faith in the supporting cast as who's going to be their second um, kind of go-to scorer. Um, Jalen Brunson obviously isn't going to be as efficient as he was last year. Um, shooting 54% from the field. If he is, boy, that's good news. Um, because, you know, playing behind, bes- beside Josh Hart opens up a lot of opportunities. Um, I think Jalen Brunson um, could use a year getting used to the go-to guy, and I think his senior year um, we could see him really turn that superstar like Josh Hart, Hart turned into. Um, 
I think the big question for me is who's going to be that second go-to scorer? Well, I know that Bridges is capable of being that second, second scorer, but I'm just worried pass. that... He just can be passive offensively sometimes. I don't know if it's even him being passive. It could be just... I don't know if there's enough touches. You know, they have Brunson. Well, last year, maybe not this year because now Hart and Jenkins are gone. But last year, if you look at it, they had Josh Hart and Chris Jenkins. You know that Chris Jenkins is going to average 7 to 10 shots a game, take his uh, his shots from behind the three-point line. And with Josh Hart being an All-American and winning the Julius Irving Award for uh, top small forward, I just think that there weren't enough touches last year for Bridges to really show what he could do on offense. I don't even think he was aggressive. I I just don't think he was aggressive enough when he was on offense. I think we could see that. Uh, And if he steps in that role, I think we could see um, a player that can compete at that level. Um, But, I mean, that's that's a big if. And they're going to need – last year you knew you were going to get scoring from Jalen Brunson and Chris Jenkins. Um, Now I think it's important. I think you're going to have a question mark with that second go-to scorer. And on top of that, your third go-to scorer. I think of uh, a guy like Eric Paschal as someone that could um, step up. Um, I think he's going to come off the bench um, because I I like the kind of lineup that they've been going in the past with um, kind of four guard type players and a big man uh, that they kind of started with the Daniel Chefu days. And um, I like I like that line that they've had for the past couple of years. I think that's good. And I think um, J-, J. Wright values having a guy off the bench that can come in and bring him a spark and score him spark especially. And um, I think that Eric Pascal could give them that. Um, you know, you saw someone like – he did that last year. Um, DiVincenzo did that last year. And I think that we'll uh, see a similar thing this year. Um, I think he's someone that could score off the bench, especially after what we saw uh, at its time at Fordham. Um, obviously, Mikel Bridges could be that guy. And then DiVincenzo. I mean, no one – we saw moments where we're like, dang. I mean, DiVincenzo was really good. Um, you know, I feel like other times he'd disappear. Uh, and we just don't know if he can be that guy. Obviously, he was, you know, coming out of high school, he's one of the most highly touted scorers in the country. Yeah, I think it's uh... – Point to bring up for DiVincenzo. I know you mentioned Delaware's that. Delaware's Michael Jordan. Isn't that what they called him? Yeah, that's what uh, they called him. I know you said he was, you know, inconsistent at times, which he was. But, you know, he had a lot of um, big games last year. And he also had a game-winning tip-in against Virginia in a big win. Um, I don't know. I think that Dante could be that second go-to scorer. One person we could be overlooking is Amari Spellman. Amari Spellman missed last year, like I mentioned before, because of being um, forced to redshirt. And, you know, he is someone who is um, it's a big body. He's six foot nine, 245 pounds, boy, give boy, or take. Boy, boy. So he's nice the one who could bang down low. Big. But one thing I was surprised to learn was that he could step out and hit the three. Yeah, I mean, that's going to be a huge aspect to the team um, and something that we haven't seen a lot from uh, Villanova Bigs in the last couple of years. Um, just the ability for the point guard to operate in that pick and roll offense and have the opportunity for a pick and pop situation. We saw it sometimes with Chris Jenkins where they would use Chris Jenkins, uh, but it'll be interesting to see when they use a legitimate big man. Uh, you can see that's um, you know happening at times with... with uh, with Spellman, um, based on his ability to step out and hit, and hit the mid-range three-point shot, um, along with the roll to the basket and make a layup. And now, Spellman was uh, rated ranked ninth, number 16 in ESPN's top 100 and was number five from the list of power forwards. He recorded a double-double, 12 points, 15 rebounds at the Jordan Brand Classic before um, enrolling at Villanova. And he was... Averaging 16 points and seven rebounds per game in his final year at St. Thomas More before his prep season at a school located in Oakdale, Connecticut. I just think that, you know, Spellman probably may be at an advantage because he got to sit out last year, even though, you know, he didn't get a chance to play in games. He did get a chance to practice with the players. His teammates got a chance to, you know, get acclimated to being in college. And this is in addition to taking the prep year at the school in Oakdale. So I think that, you know, he's ready. He's someone that, you know, is going to 
be the starter from day one, should be able to, you know, stay in the lineup throughout the season, and he should be able to average a double-double this year. I think that Ooh. it's been a while since double Nova ha- has had – I think so. You know, who's gonna, that's, that's who else task. is going to re- – but who else is going to rebound the ball for him? I mean, Bridges They're not gonna, can I mean, we, But Bridges is only one guy. I know Bridges and DiVincenzo can rebound, but, you know, maybe not a double-double, but definitely six or seven rebounds – and scoring ten points, I don't think is too far fetched because no, I agree. He's gonna score. He's gonna I score agree. a lot from the post. Yeah, he's gonna score a lot from the post. And I don't know. I think Spellman could have a special year. Yeah, I think it's really interesting. Uh, I wonder. Just I think he'll be the most effective newcomer. I don't know how much this newcoming, this freshman class, is gonna contribute. I think it'll be interesting to see, you know, how they fit in, especially in their first year. They're all guys that are. Um, you know, smart basketball players, normally what you get out of um, Villanova basketball guys. Uh, you know, Samuels seems like, Jermaine Samuels seems like the guy uh, that could get minutes in his first year, but I don't see the Philly natives, uh, Demir Cosby Roundtree and uh, Colin Galepsi um, playing much in the first year. Although people, you know, sit here and want to compare Galepsi to Ryan Archidiakono, um, I think they're actually kind of different players. I think that... Um, Colin Glepsy is more athletic than Ryan Archidiakono is. Um, I think that Ryan Archidiakono, uh, they both bring that toughness factor. Um, and I, I think Colin Glepsy, um could be, um, you know, I don't know if he'll be as good as Ryan Archidiakono was, but, um, you know, I think people are quick to kind of say, oh, he's the next Ryan Archidiakono, let's get him in there playing. Um, I think he might need some time to adapt, but he's an underrated player and someone who's not going to back down from competition. Scored 40-plus points against Quad A Green in the Catholic League um, last year in the regular season game and then defeated him in the playoffs as well, scoring another 20 on him. So, you know, he's played against the best and he's competed against the best. Um, I wonder, I don't know if he'll be able to fit in with just how many, you know, with Phil Booth, Jalen Brunson, um, DiVincenzo, the guards that they have. And I, and I think he could see some minutes as the backup point guard, but I don't know. You know, you're not going to see him out here starting burn injury. No, I agree. I don't plan on him starting this year. I do think that he that the comparisons with Archdiakono are you know unfair, especially with him only being a freshman and not really being a top prospect coming out of high school. Not saying that Archdiakono was. I just think that with the career that Archdiakono had playing at Villanova and starting a hundred plus games. I think that it's unfair this early to, you know, compare him to someone who's already had a career and won a, like had a spectacular career. Now, as far as uh Gillespie's story, he w- really he came into his senior year being a under the radar player. He wasn't, you know, highly recruited out of high school. Um, yeah, he played on the he played on the um team final B team. I think that's just so funny. Play, played, played behind on the team final but played behind guy, you know, like Deron Russell at Rhode Island. Um, I just think that's, you know, played played on the B team. That just tells you how underrated he is, regardless of how good the team final program is. Yeah, I think that, you know, what really helped him in his recruiting process and being able to commit to Villanova and them having interest in him is how he played for Archbishop Witt last year. He led them to a Philadelphia Catholic League title as well as a PI AA state championship. Uh, he averaged 24.1 points per game. And, you know, one thing that, you know, I've seen so far since he's been at Villanova is just his willing to his willingness to do whatever it takes to help his team win in scrimmages and um, in practice every day. He's someone that's going to die for loose balls and it make the extra pass and try to you know, do the small things that sometimes don't show up in the on the stat sheet, which is why I think that he does, you know, uh, is very similar to Archie Diakono. I just don't think that, you know, they're the same player. That's something that, you know, it's easy to say that he's similar to Archie Diakono because, you know, we've already seen Archie Diakono play for four years and, you know, they look similar. They just have it. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want to bring that up, but they look similar. They, you know, have a similar build. Um, I w- like you said about... Uh, Gillespie being more athletic, Archie Dakinon wasn't someone who was really dunking the ball uh, very often. He was more of a, you know, if he had a open court uh, opportunity, he probably was going to lay it up and not dunk it. 
I think that, you know, one way Gillespie could see time this year is if he's if he continues to do what he's been doing and, you know, competing on a defensive end. I know early on with Bridges and with, you know, a lot of guys who come into Jay Wright's program, I think that first year, you know, we all know from them playing in high school that they could score the basketball. They want to be, you know, playing at this level if they couldn't. But at the D1 level, we have freshmen coming in. Typically, you want them to really focus on the defensive end. And I think that Samuels, as well as Gillespie, can, you know, find minutes on this team this year if they're willing to compete on the defensive end and focus on, you know, moving without the ball and learning from Bridges and Brunson and Phil Booth. Yeah, I do want to add this. I don't want to take anything away from Colin Gillespie. Um you know, he's a, he's a knockdown shooter. He's sneaky athletic, which I don't think people give him credit for. And he is a straight gamer. He's not going to back down from anything. And I think his ball handling is better than um, what most people think uh, of him. I think he's a very strong ball handler. I think he's, uh, he's just a good basketball player. And he's someone that can hit a contested jump shot and get to the rim. And I think he's going to see minutes as the reserve point guard. And I think he will get minutes. We saw him get minutes in the scrimmage. Um, I'm pretty sure he started. And uh, I think that down the line, he's going to prove a lot of people wrong. I think that he'll be really good, um, for instance, by his senior year. Um, And I think he could have a role this year um, similar to, you know, Shavar Newkirk his first year. I mean, I'm thinking of St. Joe's right now. Lamar Kimball his first year. I don't think he's going to start like like Kimball did. Uh, um, You know, I, I don't even know if he'll have the role like Phil Booth had. I mean, that would be the hope. I mean, if he had the role like Phil Booth had his freshman year, you're you're in you're in good hands this year with your backup point guard. Yeah, and uh, to go back to what you said about him being great by his senior year, I think the relationship between him and Jay Wright is something to look forward to. I think that you know Jay Wright posted, uh, tweeted out a video of Gillespie diving for a ball during the Drexel exhibition and saying that you know that's the right way to play the game. So I'm sure that their relationship is only gonna grow over the years that's for sure I think uh, Dada Roundtree is someone else uh, someone else that could you know contribute down the line I think he's someone that the uh, uh, Villanova hasn't seen in a couple years which is a a skinnier lankier guy that can run the floor block shots Uh, we you know kind of got used to Daryl Reynolds last year and we're going to get used to Mari Spellman this year and his backup point guards are similar in a sense of Tim Delaney and I guess Dylan Painter's a little skinnier uh, and Eric Pascal, you know, those are all bigger, bulkier guys. Uh, Dada brings, um, you know, a different a switch up in that sense. Yeah, and Roundtree played with Quade last year oh, at New England yeah. so he played with he played with someone who's playing at Kentucky currently. So you know, being able to share the floor with Green was probably a great experience, and you know, they were able to <laughs> work magic in the pick and roll. You know. Green wanted to attack the basket. He could blow by defenders, and if they tried to double Quade, then he would just dish it off to his man, Roundtree, and he would finish at the rim. I was really impressed by his stat line, even though, you know, with his athleticism in the Catholic League and in the state of Pennsylvania, and even on the AAU circuit being 6'9", 220, you know, I know that he probably, at this at the college level, he's going to need some time to develop, but he was averaging 15.9 points, 11.5 rebounds, and what was most impressive to me was the 3.5 blocks. If he can, you know, give, if he can protect the rim or give anything for Villanova with the blocks, I think that he could definitely, you know, see sometime this year, but, you know, more than likely, you know, take this year as a time to develop and to, you know, get more comfortable with the college game. Yeah, I'm really excited to see how the combination of of Colin Galepsi and uh, Dada uh, Crosby Roundtree develops over the next couple of years because, you know, they're going to play the next four years together and they're going to get legit minutes and they're both Philly guys, obviously, and, uh, and they're both, I think, going to come off the bench this year and see reserve minutes and I think they're going to come in at the same time. So it'll be interesting to see because I think they're going to be playing a lot together and then next year if Jalen Brunson does declare... Um, you'll see someone like Colin Gillespie probably st- uh, step into the starting lineup, and you know they might opt if if Mikael Bridges if Mikael Bridges ends up um, going to the NBA, you know you might see someone like that around Crosby Roundtree step in. So 
It's been really important to see their relationship develop. And someone that we haven't even talked about is Jermaine Samuels. Uh, and, and he's the most likely uh, of the three to get major minutes and maybe even see starting minutes. If I mean, do you think that's a, you know, a fair assessment? Do you think he could see starting minutes by the end of the year? Or is this team too Possibly. Too deep? It might be a little too deep just because of what they've done in the past. What I think Dante has solidified and shown us, you know, what he's capable of doing, and it'll be hard to push him out the way. You know, Phil Booth, like I mentioned before, missed a lot of time last year with knee inflammation. So, you know, fingers crossed that, you know, he solved that issue and can play the full season. So I think it's going to be hard for Samuels to break into the rotation. Not not break into the rotation, break into – the starting five, but I definitely see him being the first guard off the bench. You know, he really, he's probably the only, the only guard that, you know, they can bring right off the bench besides, you know, Pascal, who's not a guard. He's, you know, taller and, you know, bigger, but he's someone who uh, has the ability to dribble the basketball. With Samuels, he's a 6'5", 225, uh, 225 pound forward. He's from Massachusetts and went to the River School there in Massachusetts. He was a four-star recruit in high school. He uh, helped his high school to a 20-6 and six record. And, you know, the one thing that I think helps him try, that could help him uh, down the line, and, you know, this season break into the starting lineup is his ability to play multiple positions. We know that at Villanova, like you mentioned before, they like to have four guards and one big. And with Samuels at 6'5", and him being an explosive athlete and being versatile, I think that he could play one through four uh, for the Wildcats this year. And he's someone he's he's a willing com, he's a competitor. He's someone that's going to compete at both sides of the court, and you know he's going to give his all. So I think that's something that you know could uh, impress Jay Wright and maybe uh, cause him to put Samuels in a few games and hopefully let Samuels make a few spot starts. Yeah, that's for sure. It'll be super interesting to just see. I mean, I'm really just interested to see um, how these three mesh together because I think that they're all got three guys that were underrated and that flew under the radar uh, for most of their high school careers. And I think that they're all three people that could have the same impact that that Ryan Archidiakono class had in the sense where they spend four years really playing together, becoming so comfortable with each other that they complement each other so well that, that their weaknesses don't show. It's only their strengths that show. And that's Villanova basketball. They whip the ball around. Um, they're going to get good shots every time. And if you make a mistake, they're always going to make you pay. And and that's the kind of relationship that Jay Wright builds with these four-year guys and these guys that, you know, Galepsi and Cosby Roundtree and, um, you know, Samuels are all going to play together for his next uh, four years. And um, that's going to be really important for their development and as a for the team to get back to national championship. Now you brought up Jay Wright's system, and I just think that with Jay Wright, he just has the knowledge at this point in his coach career that he knows what players he needs to bring in, he knows what players fit his system, and 2016 showed that his system does work. You know, one thing, we look at a Villanova roster compared to other college basketball rosters, compared to professional rosters, you see that there's not that many players that are, you know, getting minutes or are factoring into the you know the win loss column. So I think it's just a testament to his system and his ability to put guys in the right position to win. You know, I think there are some guys with Villanova who could play at, you know, the programs that send off guys in the NBA after one year. I think Bridges could be one of those guys who ultimately probably will play in the NBA after leaving Villanova but could have went to a larger program. He probably wasn't, you know, as highly rated back then as he is now. But, you know, since the NCAA tournament when he played and, you know, he showed what he can do, he's a NBA prospect, hopeful now. I just think that with Villanova, since Jay Wright's the coach and the system he has in place, they always have a chance to, you know, do something special, no matter if they have, you know, an eight-man rotation or a, you know, ten-man rotation. You know, they don't play that many players, but they get production like they play two, uh, two different squads like Kentucky did a few years back. Yeah, and that's the, what the J Wright system does, and it just it it puts you in the position where um, people are going to get open shots, and that's why you see people like Josh Hart 
and Jalen Brunson, two guards that are taking a high percentage of shots, shooting above uh, 50% from the field um, and shooting above 37% from three. Josh Hart shot as high as, as 40. And, that, and that's just, I feel like that's a product of the system and a product of, of Jay Wright's recruiting of good basketball players. And that's what you're going to get in this freshman class as well. These are good basketball players that have proven people wrong again and again. And um, they're going to continue doing that. They're going to run the offense well. And um, they're going to commit to winning. And that's what all three of them did, um, especially uh, Cos- Crosby Roundtree and, uh, and um, Colin Galepsi. And the system is meant to get good shots and good opportunities. And three of the top four scorers shot above um, 50% uh, from the field. And that's, that's, that's practically unheard of in NCAA. And I think that says a lot. They were ranked eighth in the country in field goal percentage at 49% as a team. 49% as a team. I mean, that's just, it just, it can't even register how, how efficient and good that is. Yeah, they were really efficient last year. Like you mentioned, they were one of the highest uh, teams with a uh, field goal percentage. They had an, the fourth highest offensive rating in the country at 117.6. And, but, you know, at the same time, they had one of the higher uh, defense ratings in the system, in the country as well at 95.5 so they are a very efficient group they take quality shots and they like you said they're just they play the game the right way that's one way that's one thing you always know about Villanova basketball you know every year they're going to play the right way and most times they get the results as well Yo, now we've talked a lot about how this team has been uh super um you know it's, it's going to be really good this year um, you know, there got to be some things that are going to hold this team back. Where are you looking at the weaknesses of the team, and how are they going to cure those weaknesses? I think one of the weaknesses has to be trying to replace the reduction of one of the most successful senior classes, well, one of the most successful classes in general in a little over history. Uh, Chris Jenkins, Daryl Reynolds, and Josh Hart, since they were freshmen, um, had never lost back-to-back games, which I think is – crazy. They never lost back-to-back games during their entire college career. So I think that trying to, you're not going to be able to uh, replace the entire production of Jenkins and Hart because, you know, what they did was something that, you know, they just don't have the three-point shooter like Jenkins or Hart with him being able to, you know, break down a defender and, you know, be a all All-American. But I do think that, you know, they do have players that can, you know, contribute in their own ways. I think that, you know, the way they can counter the weakness, counter the loss of Hart and Jenkins is what we mentioned before is moving the basketball, being efficient from the field, and taking high quality shots. Another weakness that I, you know, think that this team may struggle with is their front court. I know in years past they haven't struggled with only playing with one to two big men, typically only one. Uh, this year. Like you mentioned, it looks like Amari Spellman is going to be that guy that right asked to uh, man the middle and be their lone big man. And I don't know, I worry at times with Villanova and only playing one big man because what happens if that person gets into foul trouble? You have to go to the bench to you know put in someone who you know typically wouldn't see that many minutes. Uh, I wouldn't say that Villanova is particularly deep at that position. You have Spellman, who most likely will start. You have Pascal, who could play the five if um, Spellman were to get into foul trouble to relieve the, that problem until, you know, the second half. And, you know, after that you have uh, Cosby, Roundtree, and, you know, one person we haven't talked about is Dylan Painter, who hasn't really played very much since he uh, – he didn't really play much last year in his freshman year. But I just, you know, worry about their front court depth and – Another thing would just be um, the in-conference uh, battles against teams like Butler and, you know, Seton Hall and, you know, it, uh, most teams in their conference. I think that, you know, we play against the same program every year. They start to pick up on things. And with Villanova winning the championship, winning the national championship, I think that was great for the program. But that put a target on their back for teams to want to beat them. Every night they play, everyone in the country wants to beat them because – 
They won the national championship two years ago. Everyone knows about Villanova. They know how successful they've been. So, you know, I think the target is going to be on their back, and hopefully this year's team is able to um, keep up the legacy that the previous rosters have been able to uh, accomplish. I think that I think that the main um, kind of problem for uh, Villanova this year is going to be uh, two things. I think it's going to be depth, and I think it's going to be um, – I think it's going to be uh, three-point shooting. Uh, last year, um, you know, they they had three-point shooters, but I think they at times they could have used another three-point shooter to stretch the floor. Um, Chris Jenkins shot only 36% from three last year, um, and Josh Hart, their best player, shot 40% from three, but they didn't have anyone else that got that shot above 40% from three. Um, Mikhail Bridges shot uh, 39%, so he's pretty close. Um, I lo- I think that they're going to need that to happen. Um, DiVincenzo, that's obviously not his number one thing that he does. DiVincenzo, in my mind, is a scorer, um, first and foremost. I look at, uh, you know, I think that they're going to need Mikel Bridges to step up in that department. Um, And I think that someone like Amari Spellman, if he can hit that three, uh, would be important. Phil Booth, if he can come in and and if, you know, he's playing beside Jalen Brunson, obviously Phil Booth's going to be off the ball in that case, I would assume. And... Uh, if Phil Booth can provide some space, I think that'd be really important for allowing someone like Amari Spellman to really go to work down uh, down low. The other thing is depth, and I think the depth is really going to start with um, how the freshmen play, because you know you're going to get something from Eric Pascal. Uh, you know you're going to get uh, production from, you know, well, really Eric Pascal is the really only person you're looking at on the bench that has, you know, that we're projecting to come off the bench that has. Um, legit in-game experience. Dylan Painter played a little bit last year, but I think he's honestly going to be um, pressured by his fellow uh, team final alum alumnus in uh, Dada uh, Cosby Roundtree, and I think that they'll be going at it. I think it'll be interesting to see um, because I don't think both of them are going to play next to Pascal coming off the bench. Uh, so I think one of them is going to emerge. It'll be interesting to see. I think Colin Gillespie pretty much has a lock at the backup point guard spot. And it'll be really important for him to kind of uh, be able to spill Jalen Brunson a little bit. Because we know that Jay Wright, unlike some other coaches, won't play his starter 38 minutes. Josh Hart only played 33 minutes last year. Jalen Brunson only played 31. It's going to be really important, and he really values. Um, it's very important for him to have that solid point guard off the bench. And it's going to have to be, um, you know, Colin Gillespie is going to have to fill that role, and it's going to have to give spills. Uh, for Booth, who's coming back from an injury, and Brunson, who's going to be carrying a lot of the load. And I think Colin Glepsey can do it, and I think he'll surprise so many people with his toughness and his ability to fight back, and he won't back down from anything, and you'll see that from game one. And he's a gamer, and he's going to be someone that you're going to want. Um, honestly, you're going to want him at the end of the game, in the game. And you look at a guy like Jermaine Samuels. Um, Jermaine Samuels was a legit prospect coming out of high school, uh, 52nd in the class, uh, and had his, you know, considered Duke, Kansas, Indiana, Georgetown, chose Villanova. He's a guy that can hit the three, um, but he's more of a Mikel Bridges kind of guy. Uh, he's crafty finisher, very athletic, um, can shoot the three. He's a, okay. He's a pretty good defender. Um, someone that is going to uh, have to utilize his athleticism to become a better defender. And playing with Mikel Bridges is only going to help that. And he could be really important for coming off the bench as someone that could challenge. Uh, a lot of the uh, he could challenge I think some of the older guys for some minutes too I think he could steal minutes from a guy like Phil Booth if he if Phil Booth isn't producing and you look at his size um, he's 6'5 uh, 225 somewhere around that range and he's someone that you know is you think of like athletic wing you're thinking lanky long he's thick too 225 is big he's come in already at that um, Jermaine Samuels is going to be a force to be reckoned with. He's going to be really important off the bench, especially if he can provide uh, the ability to stretch the floor early on. Yeah, I think that they have the potential to be a solid group. Um, they don't have the depth I think they've had, like they've had in years past. But this team is definitely capable of, you know, putting it together. And I think it'll be interesting to see how it all shapes out. Yeah, it's going to be really important that they get, uh, you know, some production from unknown sources because 
Uh, as of right now, other than Eric Pascal, their bench is all unknowns. And especially at the big man position, they don't have a big man in the lineup. I mean, unless you're considering Eric Pascal a big man. Um, you know, Mari Spellman hasn't played a college basketball game. Dylan Painter's played in only 22 games. Uh, you know, Tim Delaney has played very minimal minutes. And then uh, Cosby Roundtree has, you know, hasn't played a game, obviously. So it's a big question mark coming in there in the front cart. But I feel like that's, you know, same thing last year. And Villanova still found a way to get it done. They always seem to find a way. Yeah. So you want to take a look at the schedule and maybe uh, uh, mark up some predictions for the team? Yeah. The schedule... I, you know, I looked at it. They had the blue and white scrimmage. They had an exhibition for, uh, they had a charity exhibition on November 1st against Drexel. Um, their first home game, their first, their season opener against, is against Columbia. And then towards the end of the month, November 22nd through November 24th, they go and play in the Bahamas. They're taking part in the battle for Atlantis. Their first opponent is Western Kentucky, and you know, depending on if they win, if they do win, win or lose, their they should next win. Opponent could be, <laughs> they most likely will win. But I'm saying, you know, in the case scenario, they will either play Tennessee or Purdue. Uh, all these games will be televised on the ESPN networks, and you know, once they come back from the Bahamas, they face Penn. Uh, Penn is traveling to Villanova this year, and. You know, whatever Penn and Villanova play, it's always, uh, you know, a game that I think a lot of people are interested in seeing. Of course, Villanova is the favorite going into the game, but, you know, I think it's a good opportunity to see some Big Five basketball and for Penn to see, you know, how they stack up against a nationally ranked team. Yeah, I think that will be really interesting. And then, um, you know, after Penn, they go they go at St. Joe's, which obviously is going to be a competitive game. You know, at St. Joe's, we all know Hager Arena can get can get rocking very quickly. And then um, Gonzaga, number a preseason ranked Gonzaga team that obviously provides a uh, you know some strength some strength to the schedule. Honestly, I mean, obviously their expectations get to a championship in the Atlantis tournament, but. Um, this is this. I'm kind of underwhelmed by this non-conference schedule, and I don't think that um, it presents a a lot of what you want as a Villanova fan for res, resume building wins. Yeah, I think that you know, I saw Gonzaga, who was probably the most uh, is the best team they're facing in the non-conference part of the schedule. You know, they do have the early season battle for Atlantis tournament, but other than that, they're playing against. You know, City Six teams and uh, they're playing against Hofstra before, you know, going into conference play. I just, I don't know. I think that they're really going to have to, well, which they've done in the past, do really well in conference and, you know, hope for the teams in their conference to, you know, have, uh, you know, a good ranking so that those wins will, you know, be uh, important once uh, tournament season comes around. You know, of course, we know that Villanova will you know, do well this season, they'll probably be a 20-plus win team. I just think that, you know, in years past, we've seen them play a tougher uh, non-conference schedule and playing more than just one tournament. Yeah, I mean, the good for them that the Big East is pretty good this year. And they'll face, uh, obviously, Butler beat them twice last year. So that's obviously going to be a tough game. And then playing teams like, um, you know, uh, they're going to play against Seton Hall, who's ranked to start the year, Xavier. Um, and then, you know, sneaking in there is a Connecticut team, Jan- uh, January 20th. Um, kind of sneaks in the middle of uh, conference play. Um, you know, kind of throwing it back a little bit to the old Biggies days. But, uh, you know, so that obviously adds a little bit. Connecticut will be good, even though they've uh, struggled in years past. And, and um, but, you know... I expect more, you know, you don't really want the season to start out. Columbia, Nichols, Lafayette, Western Kentucky, Penn, St. Joe's. Those are six games you expect to win, and you expect to win every single game by uh, 10 points. At least. Yeah, you expect for, at least. You expect for Villanova to take care of business early on in that non-conference schedule, going against those opponents who, you know, aren't, you know, at the level of Villanova. And I think that it'll be interesting to see how, this team meshes. You know, they lost 
three important players like we've mentioned throughout the podcast and you know they're really going to have to step up the three freshmen Jermaine Samuels Colin Gillespie and Dada they all have to you know hopefully step up and do something for the team that's you know probably seven or eight deep yeah but that's like kind of feels like every Villanova team uh I mean hopefully no injuries um will derail them uh, but, you know, Bench is really going to need to step up. Uh, looking at the projection, I think this is a, you know, a third seed Villanova team. Um, I don't necessarily see this as a first or second team Villanova team. Obviously, the expectation is to make the tournament. <laughs> um, and I think third seed, um, fourth seed is where you'll see this team. I, I just don't know how far this depth is going to get them. And, I mean, we'll see how good Jalen Brunson really is. And... Um, just, you know, a second score to step up is going to be so important. I see third, fourth seed, and an Elite Eight appearance, um, Sweet 16 appearance. Uh, I don't think this is a team that, that uh, has the firepower um, this year to make a run. I think next year with everyone a year older, um, without losing a whole lot, um, assuming everyone comes back, I think it could be a year that they make a national championship run and the freshmen having one more year. But um, I, I can't see it happening this year. Again, I can't see it happening either. I don't see them going, you know, to the Sweet 16. I think they'll get past. You don't see them going to the first... Sweet 16? Or you do? I possibly. I think that, you know, last year they lost in the second round, and I thought they had a – I thought their team last year was more talented than this year. And, you know, with them being uh, a lower seed, most likely going into the tournament, I don't know. I think that they can make the Sweet 16, but – Anything past that is, I think, overachieving for them this season. Yeah, I mean, it's lots going to um, ride in the hands of um, Jalen Brunson. Yeah, and it's, uh, I think he's definitely the guy for the job. He, you know, one thing we mentioned that hasn't mentioned about Brunson since he's gotten to Villanova is his basketball IQ. He's someone that, you know, plays like he's, a 30-year-old, he doesn't play like his uh, his actual age. So I think that he's definitely capable and uh, someone that can rise to the occasion. Uh, we'll just have to find out if uh, that'll, you know, happen this year. Yeah. Uh, do you have anything else to add in general about the, uh, the team or their season? I think that, you know, our prediction seemed a little... Uh, a little sad. We made it seem like negative, you know, negative. winning 20, 20 plus games is a bad thing. <laughs> being a three seed is something that is a comparison to the other city six teams. Hey man, but that's how good I think we... Villanova's gotten, man. That's how good they've gotten. <laughs> so, you know, with Villanova, we just have, you know, we have the highest expectation of them going and, you know, winning the national championship two seasons ago. So that's why it can at times seem like we're, you know, downplaying how good this team actually is. But, you know, I think that, of course, they're going to put in a 20-plus win season, go to the tournament, and whenever you make a tournament, whenever you make the tournament, anything can happen. Oh, for sure. And we've seen Vill- it go both ways for Villanova, losing in the, in the second round or making it all the way to the NCAA championship and winning it. So it really can go both ways. But thank you for listening to the Empire's uh, Villanova season preview. Um, we'll be covering... Um, all the City Six teams um, talking about uh, how we see their seasons playing out. We'll be using uh, two forms of media. We'll be doing a podcast and a written report um, to uh, help explain and uh, give a comprehensive preview of the teams and their seasons. So thank you for listening, and uh, we look forward uh, for you to listen again. Thank you. I'm Benjamin Simon. And I'm William Derry. Thank you very much.